So I'll begin recording now and then um, we'll get to introductions. Oh, great. So hello everyone, my name is Savannah Donovan and I am the outgoing environmental public program coordinator at the Urbana Park District and the incoming environmental program manager. So I'm kind of in this transition stage right now um, but I'm really thrilled to be here representing the Urbana Park District and um, kind of what we've been working on in uh, our own climate action planning. Today, um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of climate change and uh, then we can delve into some more specific opportunities and uh, local impacts. I want to give um, our other two Urbana Park District staff an opportunity to introduce themselves. So I'm joined by Elsie Hedgespeth and Ashley Dennis. Elsie, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thanks, Savannah. I'm Elsie Hedgespeth. I'm the Outreach and Wellness Manager for Urbana Park District. And we're really thrilled to uh, be able to call upon our, our staff to help within our department for our wellness workshops. So Ashley and I run programming on the eight different dimensions of wellness one of which being environmental wellness. So we're really, really lucky to have just such a vast knowledge base amongst our own uh, coworkers at the Park District that we can offer programming such as this. Uh, I do wanna say that Ashley and I will be monitoring the chat. Um, so if you have any questions that you'd like to type directly in there to everyone, we'll make sure that Savannah can um, you know, hear those and or see those as she's kind of working off two to three different screens in her office right now. Um, and also feel free to use um, the hand raise feature on uh, Zoom and Ashley and I can make sure that you get called upon. But thanks for joining. And my name is Ashley Dennis and I am the Outreach and Wellness Coordinator for the Park District. So I work hand in hand with Elsie. But um, yeah, thanks again, Savannah, for being our expert today. Don't call me an expert, Ashley. <laughs> I am uh, doing my best to stay informed on, you know, all aspects of the climate crisis, both global and local. And so in addition to working here at the Anita Purvis Nature Center, I am also a climate reality leader through the Climate Reality Leadership Corps. Um, you can find information about the Climate Reality Project online, but you're probably familiar with Al Gore's inconvenient truth, right? Um, that was kind of a big awakening to at least me, you know, I think I was uh, just finishing high school at the time that was released and, and I hadn't really heard much about climate change before that time. So <clears throat> I had the privilege to be trained by Al Gore virtually in August of 2020. And um, so this presentation, uh, the core of it comes from the Climate Reality Project And uh, the, the core of this presentation is focusing on the climate crisis and its solutions. So I do want to give you um, a little bit of a, of a warning. It gets a little scary on the front end, but don't worry, it gets better <laughs> as we go along. So don't, don't feel yourself losing hope too quickly. <clears throat> so you probably recognize this picture. It's called the Blue Marble. And this is the most published photograph in all of history. Kind of makes sense why, right? It's like the, the first picture that we really got to see, you know, this all encompassing planet where we live. Um, it's really impactful photo, I think. It was taken during the last Apollo mission. And what's really powerful about it is it, it captures the complete circle of our Earth and it, it helps us see the big picture of our planet. So we're going to start with three questions that have to be asked. Must we change? Can we change? And will we change? The first question, must we change, is one that requires some explanation about what the climate crisis is all about. I'm guessing some of this information is going to be, you know, repetitive to some of you, but um, please feel free to ask questions if there's anything I can go more in depth on. So this photograph here, this is the horizon of the earth. And it illustrates how thin the sky is. 
So when you look up, when you're outside, it looks like this vast expanse, right? There's a lot of blue above us. But if you could drive a car straight up into the air at super highway speed, so like 100, 120 miles an hour, you'd get to the top of the sky in five minutes. Five minutes. We're using this space like an open sewer. This is a problem because when sunlight comes through that layer and it warms up the earth, some of the heat that's absorbed is radiated back out into space in the form of infrared radiation. That kind of makes sense, right? It's the heat's bouncing back. Some of that infrared radiation is trapped by our natural greenhouse layer. So the greenhouse effect, this is a natural effect. This is something that's been taking place on planet Earth since we've had this layer of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. It keeps temperatures within a healthy boundary. You know, these are the temperatures that uh, we've evolved to exist within. The problem is that we're thickening that greenhouse gas layer. And so if you notice in this graphic, less of that infrared radiation is leaving the atmosphere and more is bouncing back to Earth, okay? Humans are spewing 152 million tons of man-made heat trapping gas into that layer every single day. And as the greenhouse layer thickens, it traps more and more of the outgoing infrared radiation. So many of you probably know, where does greenhouse gas pollution come from? It comes from a lot of sources. We're gonna talk about the main one in just a moment. Transportation is a big problem. Um, there's thawing of permafrost, which is a newer source. Uh, burning of forests, that could be related to you know, agriculture um, or wildfires. Mining, methane from landfills, that's kind of an interesting one we might not always think about is just having that decomposing garbage that releases um, greenhouse gases as well. And there are other sources too. But by far, the biggest source is our dependence on fossil fuels. It results in all of this carbon dioxide being spewed into the atmosphere. And you can see in this graph that after World War II, it really started to shoot up and it's still going up. Now, I just wanna make a note, humans have lived for a long, long time on this planet without being dependent on fossil fuels in the way that we are today. So we know that we can do it. <laughs> we know we can survive without fossil fuels. And I'm going to give you lots more, um, you know, reasons for hope and alternative forms of energy here in just a bit. So correlating with that graph, we see that the global surface temperature is departing from the average. So this is going from 1880 to 2020. And uh, this departure from the average is increasing just, just in that same curve that we saw our greenhouse gas emissions increasing. Now this presentation is from uh, last year, 2020, and you know it's like every single year they're saying this is probably going to be the hottest year on record ever. 19 of the 20 hottest years on record have occurred since 2001, and the five hottest years have been in the last five years. It's a little concerning, right? <clears throat> If we step back and look at the earth as a whole, we notice that 71% of the planet is covered by the ocean. So 93% of all that extra heat that's being trapped, it's going into the ocean. What does that mean? Ocean temperatures are rising, much in the same way that we see, you know, those other graphs um, showing this, this is, a, again, a departure from average of the heat content in our oceans. Um, every year, new ocean uh, temperatures are, they're setting high record temperatures every year. And again, each year, it seems like we're going to reach a new high. So as the ocean temperatures increase, it increases the amount of evaporation, evaporative moisture that's going into the atmosphere. 
Now, this is the piece of the climate change puzzle that, you know, it took me longer to understand this component. Okay, so this is really why we are seeing changes in our weather patterns. Um, the oceans are heating up so much that it's disrupting the water cycle by vastly increasing the amount of water vapor coming off the oceans. So if you're familiar with the hydrologic cycle, evaporation is the first stage. So water vapor is evaporated, it's carried into the atmosphere. Um, it forms these atmospheric rivers of vapor uh, that go across you know, above us in the air, across the atmosphere, and then it's released as precipitation and works its way back to the sea. So that's just our basic water cycle here. So we're now seeing record-breaking anomalies in precipitation. So the number of huge downpours are increasing on a global basis. Um, they're four times more likely to occur than they were just a few decades ago. So here's a picture of what's calling a rain bomb, which is a newer phenomenon that we're seeing. And it's just an enormous downpouring of rain. So locally, you know, we probably have all seen um, different flooding events. You know, there's different types of flooding. There's, there's coastal flooding, there's flooding that occurs along rivers. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, urban flooding looking at my notes here. <laughs> and flooding in farm fields. So we don't necessarily have to be next to a river, you know, to see that all of this water doesn't have any place to go when we have a huge downpour. These uh, three slides that I just scrolled through were all from different times of the year in 2015. It was February, June, and now December of 2015. That was a wet year. And if you remember, you know, it had a big impact on agriculture. Here's one from 2017 in Villa Grove. So these were just some of the photos I was able to find to share with you, but there are many more instances of, you know, localized flooding occurring in Champaign County. In 2019, we saw 20 million acres of farms that could not be planted in the Midwest because of the downpours and the flooding. And in 2020, uh, there was a hurricane force straight line wind, the derechos, that destroyed 30% of the corn crop in Iowa. And these farmers have been going through a number of years like this. It's starting to have a really big impact. Um, so you see, again, $20 billion of damages, including $6.4 billion in federal crop insurance payouts. How long can we let this go on? You know, this is going to lead to food insecurity issues, not just locally, uh, but across the nation and possibly even have global impacts. You know, this is happening to farmers in other regions and to people all over the world. You can see on this slide, extreme rainfall events, they occur four times more often than they did in 1980. And the same extra heat that's disrupting the water cycle by pulling that moisture in the air and causing downpours, it's also pulling moisture out of the soil and making droughts deeper and longer. So this is one of the key points here in Illinois and Champaign County is that we see this flux. There's a lot of heavy rain, a really wet year, and then droughts really dry. And what farmers are seeing is an inconsistency and an inability to be able to predict weather patterns so that it's getting harder and harder to know when to plant, what to plant, when to harvest. Um, worldwide, insurance companies are paying heed because they have had to pay out every time disasters strike. And you can see the pattern here in uh, payouts. So the number of events of different types of storms, floods, mudslides, extreme temperatures, droughts and fires, these are all climate related events. Um, this does not include um, earthquakes, tsunamis or volcanic activity because those are more of geophysical events. So this is just kind of pertaining to climate change.
It's also a national security issue, and the U.S. Defense Department has for many years warned us about food and water shortages, pandemic disease, and refugee flows caused by the climate crisis. Um, you know, this quote here is from 2014, but when you start looking at the literature and delving more into some of the science behind this, um, the outbreak of a global pandemic has been predicted for a number of years. And I hate to break it to you, but the, the risk of another is, is great as well. So this is a climate crisis. It's a medical emergency. Um, we're seeing harsh impacts all around the world. Tropical diseases are moving north. And airline travel has a lot to do with this, but also the climate conditions are changing and they're changing so that these diseases can take root and become endemic. So you see up here towards Illinois, um, we definitely have some West Nile virus outbreaks at times. Um, you might remember a couple years ago when Zika virus made it into the United States. So this is a concern. Many of them are diseases that move from animals to humans. So they call those zoonotic diseases. Like COVID-19, uh, which originated in bats and then was mishandled and spread widely. So an issue um, with climate change is that different species of animals are coming into contact with each other where they never would have before. You know, both because of some of it's because of food insecurity in other countries, there is a huge market for eating wild animals. But also, um, their ranges are changing. So, you know, one animal carries a disease that might not affect it, but now it's going to come into contact with another animal that it's never been in contact before. And that disease then has the opportunity to jump. It's scary stuff. I promise I'm not going to keep scaring you for too much longer. <laughs> We also see that air pollution itself, so the cause of climate change, just that alone kills 9 million people a year. When we burn fossil fuels, we create carbon dioxide, and that's the principal cause of the climate crisis. But at the same time, we see uh, the creation of so-called conventional air pollution, and that makes people very sick and kills a lot of people. So that might include um, ozone, nitrous oxide, um, Part particulate matter. So all of those are really bad. And then you've probably heard, you know, uh, COVID is a respiratory disease. So these issues can work in tandem to harm people. <clears throat> there have been studies in the United States that show uh, this and in other countries, but it's important to focus on the racial injustice that we also see. Um, there are more deaths uh, in, from Black Americans from COVID-19, and that's because of poverty, environmental injustice, um, lack of access to health care, living conditions. Um, so this is something that we have to take note of, is that um, people in poverty, they fare a lot worse. You know, they call this environmental injustice. All right, Barbara asks in the chat, why is what does Russia have such a high level of death attributed to air pollution? Let me go back. I don't know that I'll know the answer to that. Deaths per year. Wow. Huh. That's a great question. Let me see. I have a lot of extra notes that I'm, I'm not giving you the full in-depth spiel here. So let me look through my notes and see if there's anything. If anybody else has any ideas, um, you feel free to speak up or this might be something I have to come back to and uh, look into further, Barbara, but I'm gonna take note of that. That's a really excellent question. Even Pope Francis said that the gravest effects of all attacks on the environment are suffered by the poorest people. Um, so we do need to pay special attention to 
helping and lifting up people who are poor, you know, communities of color and other historically marginalized populations. Um, there's a, a newer group called the Poor People's Campaign in the United States, and um, they're focusing specifically on these types of issues. And they're partnered with the Climate Reality Project. It's not just people, of course, uh, who are affected by the climate crisis. We're in danger of losing up to half of all living species on Earth. Pretty scary stuff. Now, you might say, you know, what does that have to do with me? It's okay if this, you know, species of frog dies or this species of plant can't be found anymore. But if you think about the history of medicine, you know, a lot of our chemical compounds and pharmaceuticals, um, that all originated in nature somehow, right? So, you know, when we lose diversity, we lose a lot. We lose the connections and the web of life that sustains all organisms, uh, but we also lose potential. We lose a lot of potential to um, learn from different species, to utilize their own adaptations, um, to learn and uh, be able to grow and, and be healthy ourselves. So the cost of carbon is immense. And I'm not gonna read these all out to you, but you know, you can see this is a lot of issues that are accumulating. We haven't even talked about ocean acidification or, you know, I'm trying to focus on local, but this is a, a threat to the global economy. So must we change? Yes, <laughs> yes, we must. <laughs> Can we change? Let's talk about that. Uh, the answer is yes, we have the solutions at hand already. 20 years ago, the best projections for wind energy were that we might reach 30 gigawatts by 2020. I'm sorry, by 2010, we've already beat that goal by 22 times over. So this is the exponential curve showing the use of wind energy and it's inspiring. It's even more inspiring when you look at the best projections for solar from 18 years ago, they estimated that by 2010, we might be able to add one gigawatt a year. When 2010 rolled around, we beat that goal 17 times over. And in 2019, we beat it uh, 121 times over. That's amazing, right? <laughs> Uh, this exponential curve is even steeper, goes up even faster. So this is world solar photovoltaic installations. And the cost of these technologies are coming down quickly, just like computers. We went through that phase, right? So this technology is becoming more common, more accessible. and we're not going to run out of solar energy. <laughs> the earth gets as much in one hour as the entire global economy uses in a full year. So imagine if we could harness all of that solar energy, our needs would be fully met forever. And we're seeing battery storage improve. So, you know, we don't just have to use solar energy when the sun is shining. Uh, these are future projections, and this is a new trillion dollar industry. So if you want to invest your money somewhere, <laughs> invest it in solar. Okay, so now is the time where I get to talk about some local opportunities. Um, hopefully you've heard about some of these, but we're really trying to work hard to spread the news about these local plans. Mm, Barbara, that's a great question. Barbara asked in the chat, what percentage of all energy use is found in alternative energies? I can show you a graph in a little while that tells us um, for Urbana, I'm sorry, for Illinois, what that is, but it's going to change state to state, of course, and, and nation to nation. Um, we are planning 
I say we, not the park district, but the city of Urbana is uh, working with Trajectory Energy and Next Amp to install these solar arrays at the site of the former landfill in Urbana. So this is going to be a massive solar installation. Um, 7,000 solar panels are being installed and what an excellent location. It's a former landfill. So not a lot of other things are going to be appropriate uses of this space at this time. It's kind of raised up. I've been out there to the site before and it's like a little hill. Um, so it gets a lot of sun, there's no trees around. Um, and basically once they get enough people subscribed to this, they're gonna start installing them. And once they're installed, they're going to create energy that's gonna go to Ameren. So this is in participation with Ameren uh, for Ameren customers. And what customers do is you subscribe to the solar for all, or I'm sorry, to the community solar plan. So you purchase a subscription and then the solar farm is giving that energy to the community's electric grid and it earns credits for you and you see those credits on your bill. So when you take the amount you pay versus the credits that you get, you get about 50% off your annual electric bill. There's community solar programs coming up all over Illinois as part of the Illinois Solar for All program. Um, the one here in Urbana is going to be an income eligible program. So it's specifically for people um, of lower to moderate income to be able to subscribe to. But we're seeing a real challenge in connecting the people who can benefit this with the resources and the ability to sign up for it. So they are having a slower time getting subscriptions. It sounds fishy. <laughs> and like, I've, I've seen these trajectory energy and Nexamp um, presentations and that's what this slide is from that you're seeing here. Um, and it takes a minute to understand how it works and realize that, you know, it's not a scam. <laughs> it is a for real thing. And the purpose is to help people and, you know, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. No one is making money, you know, off of this program. At least not to the detriment of, you know, anybody else. You really are. It's really is about energy savings. So in that scenario, you can utilize solar energy without even having panels on your house. You don't have to rent or own your home. Uh, Tally asks a good question in the chat. Um, is it just for Urbana or can others in Champaign County? I think you just need to be an Ameren customer. Um, check out, you know, community solar, Google, Google community solar um, and look for some of this. There are, so even if you live here and you're an Ameren customer, but you're not eligible um, income wise for this program, you can sign up for a different community solar program somewhere else that doesn't have that income eligibility requirement. So it's not restrictive to Urbana. It is all of Champaign. And I believe there's a few of our other neighboring counties. But what's important is that you're an Ameren customer. If you do want solar panels on your house, we have a program for that too. So um, we're coming up at the launch of Solar 6.0 in Urbana-Champaign. So this is going to be the sixth opportunity for Urbana-Champaign residents to join in this group buy program. Basically, they offer um, solar power hours. These are Zooms where you can learn about solar power um, how the program works, what is group by, what does that mean? Um, and if you choose to sign up, um, you know, they're going to walk you through this whole process of how to get solar on your house. The more people who sign up, the lower price it is for everyone. So basically a group buy is using, you know, le leveraging the power of more people to purchase um, in order to get a lower price on the panels and the installation. There's lots of information about there. So here's the website, solarurbanaschampaign.com. You can find more information. I have solar panels on my house. This is not my house, but um, I, I did the, I think it was uh, 3.0 solar, <laughs> Urbana Champaign 3.0 program. Um, and we love our solar panels. Um, if you ever wanna talk to me 
about, you know, how that whole process went, you know, you're welcome to reach out. Um, basically it is, it's free power for us. We have a little inverter, it's a box in our garage um, where the energy goes into the um, meter there. And I, I also realized that when the power went out recently, um, I have a, an outlet on my inverter. So if it was the daytime and my power went out, I could just run an extension cord from my refrigerator and plug it into that inverter and my fridge could run directly off the sunlight. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And then there's a brand new program in Urbana called Geothermal Urbana Champagne. It's another group buy program. So if you're interested in geothermal, this is what you want to look into. Um, you can Google this or you can you know, look for the website here. It's very similar to the solar program. So what is geothermal? Well, it's basically these pipes, these big loops that they're going to install underground. So this one, you know, if somebody has geothermal, you can't tell from the outside of their house. Everything's underground. And there is some of, of a process of like digging up the earth and installing these. But uh, that's pretty much the only downside because after you've got it in, um, you're able to use the stored energy within the earth to lower or increase the temperature of your home um, and help provide hot water. So these are for houses or commercial buildings. One of our facilities at the Urbana Park District does have geothermal. Uh, my parents built a house recently and installed geothermal and uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, it, it helps to keep your house cool in the summer and warm in the winter. So it's not necessarily providing you energy, but it's reducing your reliance on natural gas to heat your home in the winter, reducing your reliance on, you know, your air conditioner in the summertime. I am seeing so many more electric vehicles on the roads now too. So um, we're seeing all across the world, electric vehicles starting to take over more. Um, this exponential curve is pretty exciting. So this is a graph of the global electric car stock, um, cumulative of battery and plug-in hybrids between 2010 and 2020. So the technology is, again, it's getting cheaper every year. You maybe have seen these hybrid buses from the CUMTD moving around town. Um, when I went to get this picture, I, found an article that they are going to order some hydrogen powered vehicles. So the hydrogen power buses that CUMTD is going to order, um, they don't even have like tailpipe emissions at all. They're completely clean and very quiet, I hear. And so it's pretty exciting. I mean, I think the cost is, is higher up front, but um, you get that back over time. So Barbara is asking, are there charging stations in CU? I have, a, we have a friend and coworker with a Tesla. And so she would probably be better to answer that question. But um, I, the one that I think of first is the parking garage in downtown Champaign. Um, it's a free charging station. If you, while you pay to park there, you can charge your car. Um, I'm not sure about other charging stations, but it's it's coming up. You know, the demand is going to be there. Ashley, did you know about any other charging stations? I know there's one at the Meyer in Champaign. Mm -hmm. I've seen that one. Excellent. There. Yeah, Tess also said that. And, you know, for a while we were looking, I was looking at getting a Tesla myself and we were thinking, man, we can just plug it right into the solar inverter. <laughs> and just, you know, just sun power that car. Um, and in May every year, our community has a really great um, group of people who organize National Bike Month for Champaign-Urbana. So this was just in 2019. Of course, 2020 was a different year, but um, in 2019, they had 14 events. Um, 230 participants for bike to work day, 466 participants. Um, there's a lot of bike related education 
Um, I'll actually take a moment to ask Elsie and Ashley if they have updates about anything coming up. I think I heard about an opportunity for adults to learn how to ride a bike if they didn't know how. Is that right? There are some lear uh, learn to ride classes that are being put on by, um, oh my goodness, see you, uh, see you bikes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we partner with them to get a little bit of their programming put into our summer program guide. I have heard um, just in meetings lately, I do think that they are looking to maybe shift some of the traditional bike month activities to possibly September. So, um, and the bike month website, just the local bike month website is gonna be your best source and guide for that in a real time manner as things are still changing. Um, but at least for the month of May, I know that um, they have planned and advertised just some like come as you are group rides within some of our parks. I think they're doing a green loop ride um, during May bike month and some, some learn to ride clinics, but you do have to register for those. Um, the information for them, I'll see if I can get um, maybe some of that information typed into the chat for everyone. Thanks. And yeah, there's the CU Bike Month uh, Weebly website. So I was just visited it yesterday to, to check it out. And they are, you know, still promoting some socially distance opportunities to do this May. And then, you know, if once you get into the bike culture in town, we have, um, you know, places where you can learn how to fix your own bike. And there, there are just so many opportunities for that. All right, so can we change? Yes, yes, we can. <laughs> Will we change? <laughs> ah, now there's the real question, right? <laughs> so this is um, a, another chart of energy stocks. And right now they are the worst investments. <laughs> so business and investment communities are taking a look at the fact that fossil fuels are not a good investment anymore. Lots of them are divesting in order to stop losing money on fossil fuels. We're also seeing state governments take the lead and many of them are moving faster than required by the Paris Agreement. We're seeing a lot of cities take the lead also. So this is really hopeful. So here you see Illinois is one of 24 states representing 55% of the American people um, who have formed the United States Climate Alliance. Makes me very proud of Illinois. Um, and there are lots of companies that have made a commitment to go 100% renewable energy. Look at them all. Many of you know about the um, youth climate strikes. Greta Thunberg really has done a lot to raise awareness with youth um, that they have a voice, that they have you know, power in being able to um, petition their government or their community to do a better job. Um, we see young people really caring about this issue. So this picture I used because I, I know that I have the photo rights, but I could have easily found, you know, some pictures of local youth who are doing this sort of thing. We even have a Youth Climate Justice Forum, which is a group of teens from different high schools in Champaign-Urbana who, you know, are working together on uh, climate justice locally. So I love the pictures, um, their signs in this, in this picture. It says climate change is real. In other news, water is wet. <laughs> so you know, youth don't need to be explained to as much to understand that this is a reality. It seems more of an issue that you know, adults will dig their feet into and try to deny. Um, this one's really sad. It says you will die of old, old age. Um, you know, I can only assume that she's referencing that, you know, the, the climate crisis can possibly, you know, take lives. We also have a group of adults locally who are working together as the Champaign County Climate Coalition or C4. So we have individuals from all kinds of organizations. Um, I am one of the representatives of the Urbana Park District, but we have uh, University of Illinois Extension, East Central Illinois Master Naturalists, 
uh, Faith in Place, the City of Urbana, the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Um, one of these is this is a U of I student. Um, uh, let's see what else. Solidarity Gardens, CU. Um, so many different, you know, groups and individuals. A lot of um, other people who are related to the university are all joining this coalition to amplify each of our individual efforts and to do a better job coordinating and really pushing out um, opportunities and messaging for positive change. And I am thrilled to announce uh, for the first time publicly the acceptance of the Urbana Park District's CARES plan. Um, CARES is an acronym for Climate Action, Resilience, Education, and Sustainability. And um, in a few minutes, I'm going to uh, be able to give you a look inside that CARES plan. So this is going to a, a document that's going to guide the Park District's sustainable behaviors. Um, we're creating, you know, real actionable goals and objectives to reduce our carbon footprint. And we are doing what we can to lift up other individuals, organizations, communities to be able to do the same thing. So join us, use your voice, your vote, your choices to fight for your future, for your community and the whole world. And speak truth to power like your world depends on it because your world does depend on it. We had another right. question in the chat, Savannah. Um, City of Urbana implementing a composting program. Ah, so I've got the secret details on that <laughs> that I'm not allowed to divulge all of. Um, but I believe what the gist of it is, <laughs> is that the city is going to work on piloting a small scale program and then see what they can do from there. Um, when you look at citywide or, and large scale composting, it costs a good deal of money to get into that. Um, you have to have uh, the appropriate facilities and space to be able to process all of that compost, right? In a safe manner. Um, you have to have a special truck. So the trash truck can't take it and the recycling truck can't take it. You've got to have a compost truck, right? Just to come up to everybody's houses and pick up their compost. Um, if and when we do get a program, it might be similar to other cities where people have to purchase it to opt in. So it's probably not going to be a free service for quite some time because there has to be, you know, you have to cover the cost of the of the trucks and the people who are managing all of that and the bins that they go into. But we're working on it because so many people are demanding it. They're wanting this kind of thing. Um, we know it's feasible. We know it's doable. We just have to, uh, you know, get the ball rolling. So and then within the park district as well. Um, we, it's something that we want to do um, is, is pilot small scale composting here and see what we can do um, in the future to do better. Does anybody else have questions? I am going to open up the CARES plan to share with you, I believe. Did I? seem to get everybody else's questions in the chat. Oops, sorry. I think you got all of them, Savannah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so here's the CARES plan. It was accepted by the board uh, just last Tuesday. And uh, we've got some, you know, business on the front end. <laughs> I'm gonna show you, uh, you know, a closer look at the different parts of the plan. Uh, basically, you know, this has been over a year in the making. We have done a lot of homework to interview advisors from uh, different organizations who are kind of authorities on climate action planning and sustainability and resilience plans. Um, so this is, you know, even February of 2020 is kind of when we started this process formally. Um, we do make note of equity, inclusion, and justice issues, because as you saw in my presentation earlier, um, marginalized populations, people who are of low income, they are going to, you know, 
have more of the negative effects of climate change and reap fewer of the benefits like solar, right? So that's again why community solar is such an important program in our town and something that I think everybody should tell everybody about. I mean, think about even senior citizens who are, um, you know, limited on their incomes. Those are a great type of group of people who might be able to benefit from this. Sorry, my Zoom's getting in the way. All right. Savannah, you're accidentally muted. I'm sorry. Am I back? <laughs> sorry back. about that. You're back. That but, um, Barbara did have a question. Will copies of the CARES plan be made available to the public? Yeah, very soon, Barbara. Great question. Um, there's just uh, one little adjustment that we need to make. And um, my co-planner, Kara Dudek, uh, deserves a lot of uh, credit for you know, making this plan beautiful and helping it all come together. And she is on a much deserved vacation right now. So when she comes back, uh, we're gonna make that small change. And then we're gonna put this up on the Urbana Park District website. And we plan to announce some kind of formal release of the plan. We did do uh, quite a bit of opportunities for public input and comment through, um, we had some Zoom programs, we had some surveys go out. So you may have seen an earlier version of this or even had an opportunity to provide some input to the plan already. Um, but you know, we were pretty close to a, you know, it being final product here. So we, we talk about at the beginning of the plan, kind of our, our vision for the plan, for our community, um, and how really this is rooted in shared values. You know, um, whether or not you, um, wh wh whatever you think about climate change, we can all agree that many of these benefits or, or climate actions, they're gonna help people regardless of what you believe, you know, they're also health and wellness benefits. They are uh, benefits to the environment and to all of us. Our plan is organized in three primary pillars, uh, which are community communicating climate action, protecting and strengthening our natural environment and conserving resources. And within these pillars is where we have our goals and objectives. So I'm not gonna take the time to go through all of this with you today because it's a lot. <laughs> but you know, for, for example, our first uh, goal in communicating climate action is to communicate the importance of climate action through our internal practices here at the Park District. So we have a really high priority goal uh, objective is to develop a district-wide green purchasing program for office supplies, cleaning products, and other routine purchasing. Seems pretty basic, right? But this is a way for us to organize all of our goals. Um, we have a column called responsible staff groups, so we know who is going to be in, um, in charge of you know, making sure that these goals and objectives come to fruition. We're outlining specific strategies and performance measures so that we know when we've met our goals. And we will be doing annual evaluations of the plan. Uh, this is a five-year plan, so it will be, you know, fully reevaluated in another five years and, and every five years. Uh, we see this plan as complementing our current strategic plan, so it is separate but complementary. And this is my favorite part of the plan is, is after all of the goals and objectives um, because climate education and communicating about climate change is such an important piece of this. The CARES plan itself is an educational document as well. So if you are you know, reading through the goals and objectives and something doesn't make sense, we've got a, a glossary of terms at the back and this can be used just kind of as its own resource um, for anybody who's not familiar with some climate change concepts. So this is, again, just a couple pages of uh, glossary words, but then we have a section about climate change concepts. So 
How does weather differ from climate? What's the difference between global warming and climate change? What is the greenhouse gas effect? So we talked about that one today, but it gets into some of those issues. Um, one thing that came up a lot during our conversations with our community as we were developing this plan is talk about ecosystem services, which is also called natural capital. Those are all the benefits that nature and the environment provide to humans. And they are important for life sustaining, you know, just keeping us all healthy and alive. They are providing food, air purification, water purification, buffering of floods, um, and not to mention, you know, just happiness and, you know, the opportunity to, to recreate outside. But biodiversity is a huge component of ecosystem services. So remember when I said earlier that 50% of species on planet Earth are um, vulnerable to extinction in the face of climate change and habitat loss, um, this is really speaking to what you lose when you lose biodiversity. You know, it loses, we lose the ability of a healthy ecosystem to be able to provide these essential services. And then we wanted to also make sure that we um, included this concept called one health, which is that, you know, again, human health, animal health, and environmental health, they're all related to one another. Um, Barbara asked earlier about where, I'm sorry, uh, where our electricity is coming from in Illinois. And um, there's a really great resource where I got this graph. So a question that came up is, let's say we convert our fleet to electric vehicles and we convert all of our um, lawn care equipment and all of that. We're gonna convert everything away from gas powered to electric powered. Well, isn't our electricity coming from coal and fossil fuels? Isn't that still bad? And, and the answer is it's much, much less bad. <laughs> Electrify everything first, it's step one, electrify everything. Because um, all of these sources of electricity, we're transitioning away from the fossil fuels. We can continue to clean up and do a better job. Um, in Illinois, 57% of our power is from nuclear and only about 18% from coal, another 13.8 from natural gas. So this is your section of the fossil fuel uh, pie here in the blue and red, and it's only about a third, right? It's pretty um, uh, optimistic, I think. Um, you don't really see solar making it on the pie chart here. It's too small to be able to see, uh, but we're getting there. Um, and then we have a section that's specifically calling out what are the impacts from local to global. So much of this I've talked about, um, what are we gonna see here in Urbana and East Central Illinois as the climate changes? Uh, well, we talked about you know more uh, warmer weather. So there's gonna be more heat waves, uh, which can result in more health issues in the summertime, more extreme precipitation, so as we mentioned before, you know, a greater occurrence of precipitation and then drought periods as well. Plant hardiness zones are shifting. If you're a gardener or you know anything about uh, planting plants, you know that um, not all plants can live everywhere, right? They can only live where the temperature is um, acceptable to them. So we're seeing shifts in what plants can live where. Uh, Tally asks in the chat, do I know if there's any grants or support in Illinois for transitioning your home from gas to electric? That's a great question. Um, and I'm not sure where, where to direct you to start, but I am, there's got to be some more information out there about this topic. Let me think about that for a moment, Tally, and I'll come back. Um, so anyway, this is about the end of the plan here. You know, we see impacts to agriculture, human health, 
And then we go on to mention the global and national impacts as well. Um, in the sources section, we've got some really amazing uh, sources. So I even think if you just want to do more research, it, this is a great place to go to, to just, you know, link to other sources. And then um, I know Jennifer had a question about resilience. So I'm hoping I can answer that. Does anybody have any questions? Um, any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself if you like to. I see some answers in the in the chat. Thank you to Mike for helping to answer Tally's question. So what I'm opening on my computer right now is the appendix to the CARES plan. <laughs> Thanks to those of you who came today. If you need to take off, I understand. Um, yeah, Adobe's telling me it can't open this because I need to update my computer. <laughs> oh, there we go. It's there. All right, so this is the appendix of the CARES plan. And I'll just really quickly show you this um, document called Initial Indicators of Resilience. The first two parts of our appendix are the survey results when we did our public input. So sorry, I don't mean to make you dizzy as I scroll through this. <laughs> uh, we use the public input to help us prioritize our goals, um, to help us identify goals and, and make sure that they're realistic. Um, Appendix C is from the uh, National Recreation and Parks Association, and it's their own climate statement, which they just adopted in November 9th of 2020. Um, what I really love is this statement calls out how park districts are in a very special place to be able to address climate change. And it kind of, um, you know, it mentions we, we manage <laughs> park and recreation professionals plan, manage, program, and maintain 11 million acres of public parks and green spaces across the country and so forth, uh, we're poised to bring community-driven climate solutions that build a healthy, more resilient, and more equitable future for generations to come. I love that statement. It makes me feel like, you know, the work that we do all across the Park District is, you know, really worthwhile. All right, so this is the document, Jennifer, I wanted to share with you called Initial Indicators of Resilience. And it comes uh, from the Champaign County Climate Resilience Task Force, which I'm not sure is um, an organization that's still working together. Um, but they have outlined, here's all the individuals, uh, Jim Angle, our state climatologist was involved. It's got all of the indicators of resilience broken down into different classifications. So there's social equity and governance. And then you see, you know, food security is on there. There's health and wellness. So if this is something that's of interest to you, um, ecosystem services, infrastructure, economic, you know, we kind of at the park district um, made sure that we're doing our best to focus on all of these aspects of resilience here that you see under ecosystem services uh, to make sure that we're supporting a, a healthy community. All right, well, I'm sorry to uh, go a couple minutes over, but thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to stick around for another couple minutes and, and chat, you're welcome to do so. Feel free to turn your camera on. If you have to go, Thanks so much for joining us. I do hope to post this presentation to YouTube so that we can share it with more people. So thanks everyone. Thank you. I'm gonna go back and look at Tally's um, question again. Grants and support in Illinois to transition homes from gas to electric. Yeah, I know I've heard about tax incentives. Um, what is it? I can't remember our what our Illinois um, program is called. I might just have to save the chat and come back to that. I did some. I mean, I did some googling just while you continued talking. So I, again, I am no expert. I don't know how widely applicable this is, but. I'm going to 
at least put this in the chat. I did just like a grant search. So there is that. Oh, great. All right. Well, thank you, Elsie and Ashley, for the opportunity to present today. Thanks for presenting, Savannah. It was great. That yeah. was really cool. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. I hope I did what I said I was going to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I read the description.